Um, thank you very much co for coming. Um, I just want to inform you that um, we are waiting on one of our speakers to arrive, so please bear with us and give us an additional two to three minutes. Thank you very much for your patience. Good afternoon again. Professor Jessica Byron, Director of the Institute of International Relations, the University of the West Indies. Excellencies, members of the Diplomatic Corps, the authors and presenters of this publication, um, Dr. Michelle Scobie, Dr. Cola Cameron, Dr. Christopher Cobbin, who's online via Zoom, Dr. Susan Burke, and Dr. Anthony Gonzalez, representatives of regional organizations, representatives of various government ministries, faculty, colleagues, and other staff of the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus, members of the media, students, ladies and gentlemen. A very pleasant good afternoon to you and welcome to the Institute of International Relations. It is my distinct honor and pleasure to chair um, this book launch of my colleague, 
and friend, Dr. Michelle Scobie, who's written on a very important topic, global environmental governance and small states architecture and agency in the Caribbean. I'm very proud of this publication, Dr. Scobie, not only because you, know, you are the one who has um, produced it, um, you have, not only because you have produced it, but also because it's a very relevant and timely subject for the Caribbean region at this time. At this time, I would like to welcome Professor Byron to provide greetings and welcome. Welcome, Professor Byron. Thank you. Chair, Dr. Mantout, Dr. Scobie, author par excellence, uh, distinguished ambassadors of Mexico and Costa Rica, members of the diplomatic corps, government officials, UWI colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is my great pleasure on behalf of the Institute of International Relations to welcome you all to this book launch. Dr. Scobie's book, Global Environmental Governance and Small States, Architectures and Agency in the Caribbean. We applaud Dr. Scobie's passionate dedication to her scholarship and in her daily practice to the preservation of the global and Caribbean environment. Dr. Scobie draws attention at the beginning of her book to the humanity's dependence on the natural environment and to how the environment has contributed to the rise and fall of civilizations and the damaging impact of those civilizations on the development of the global environment. She particularly emphasizes the extent to which the livelihoods and economic development of small island developing states depend on the environment. And she highlights their relative invisibility in the literature on global environmental governance. Dr. Scobie is to be commended for her scholarship, which has sought to fill this gap by focusing on the small island developing states of the, of the Caribbean community. Since 2011, Dr. Scobie has also offered a graduate course at this institute on global environmental governance. And this has contributed to preparing the region's professionals, those who pass through our portals, to understand the dynamics, the debates, and the issues of global environmental politics and governance, and their interplay with small island developing states. We also have a number of doctoral candidates here who are working on Caribbean environmental and climate change issues. And in fact, this has become one of the Institute's research clusters through the work of Dr. Scobie, other colleagues, and those students. A book launch is always a happy occasion for us, for everyone. And I am delighted to congratulate Michelle on the results of her hard work and dedicated research. We welcome her new book into the growing scholarship of the Institute of International Relations. And at this point, I will leave you. There are many interesting discussants this afternoon, and we all look forward to a very interesting couple of hours. Thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Susan Berg, um, who has arrived. Dr. Michelle Scobie is a lecturer and researcher at the Institute of International Relations at the University of the West Indies, UWI, St. Augustine, and co-editor of the Caribbean Journal of International Relations and Diplomacy. She has practiced as an attorney at, at law 
in Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela. She was the first corporate secretary of the Trinidad and Tobago Heritage and Civilization Fund. She's a member of the Caribbean Studies Association, the International Studies Association, the University of the West Indies Oceans Governance Network, the Earth Systems Governance Global Research Alliance, the Future Earth Knowledge Action Network, and the International Studies Association Long Ridge Planning Committee. Her research areas include international law, international environmental law and, the de and developing states' perspectives on global and regional environmental governance. Her most recent publication, which has been launched today, The Global Environmental Governance and Small States, Architectures and Agency in the Caribbean. I now call on Dr. Scobie to provide some reflections on the, on the publication. Welcome, Dr. Scobie, to the podium. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Professor Byron. Um, thank you, um, everyone, for coming, members of the Diplomatic Corps, um, members, uh, representatives from international and regional institutions who are here as well, um, persons as well from the ministries of government, uh, colleagues from the university. Um, uh, my, my very good friends and members of my family as well are here, and uh, actually many of my friends count among those listed <laughs> above as well. So thank you very much for coming, and mucho gusto un poco en español para agradecer la presencia de las personas aquí de habla español. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. And uh, um, yeah, so I'm going to start with some uh, brief reflections that sort of provide a thematic uh, overview for the, the book. I was thinking about going through chapter by chapter, but then I would bore you and you would sue me and I wouldn't want to do that. So rather, I'm, I provide a framework and I'd like to especially thank my colleagues who have agreed to reflect based on their own areas of expertise on specific chapters uh, taken out of the book. We're not going to do all because we want you to buy the book afterwards. So it's all, it's all strategically planned. So I'd like to start with a, a little video. This is the story of how one species changed a planet. The latest chapter of our story begins in England 250 years ago. Fueled by coal, then oil, several brilliant inventions appeared. They ignited the Industrial Revolution, which spread like wildfire through Europe, North America, Japan, then elsewhere. The great railways, then cars and highways, connected people across the globe. Medical discoveries saved millions of lives. New artificial fertilizers meant we could feed more people. Population rose rapidly. But this was nothing compared with what was to come. The 1950s marked the beginning of the Great Acceleration. Globalization, marketing, tourism and huge investments helped fuel enormous growth. People swarmed to cities, which became even more powerful engines of creativity. In a single lifetime, the well-being of millions has improved beyond measure. Health, wealth, security, longevity, never have so many had so much. Yet one billion are malnourished. In a single lifetime, we have grown into a phenomenal global force. We move more sediment and rock annually than all natural processes, such as erosion and rivers. We manage three quarters of all land outside the ice sheets. Greenhouse gas levels this high have not been seen for over one million years. Temperatures are increasing. We have made a hole in the ozone layer. We are losing biodiversity. Many of the world's deltas are sinking due to damming, mining and other causes. Sea level is rising. Ocean acidification is a real threat. We are altering Earth's natural cycles. We have entered the Anthropocene, a new geological epoch dominated by humanity. This relentless pressure on our planet risks unprecedented destabilization. 
but our creativity, energy and industry offer hope. We have shaped our past, we are shaping our present, we can shape our future. You and I are part of this story. We are the first generation to realize this new responsibility. As the population grows to 9 billion, we must find a safe operating space for humanity, for the sake of future generations. Welcome to the Anthropocene. Okay, so I, at the risk of uh, going on too long, I just wanted to show that, which is sort of the context for a lot of what I have, what, of what I've, I've written or the some of the rationale behind it you know it's um it's recognizing I like the video because it ends on a very positive note that we've shaped up our, our past and we can shape our future and this book is sort of a reflection on what are some of those areas in which we are shaping our future and how we would like to shape it towards the future so the book's intent is uh, to study global environmental governance in the Anthropocene and the place of small island developing states. It's nestled within an understanding of international relations that goes beyond the international to the global. In fact, the Institute's master's program, the name of it was changed from international environmental governance to global environmental governance, a recognition that while states continue to be important, there are many more actors involved in shaping all areas of interstate into region, even within nations, the, the governance of, of those areas. So my perspective is to look at what are those elements. I like, as many people know, many of the um, methodological suggestions that come from the um, areas of um, constructivism related to things like norm penetration and contestation. And the book looks at norm penetration and contestation with, uh, within the economic, social, historical, and geophysical development context that are particular to the region. So just an example of what I'm speaking about here. Uh, when we look at, uh, for example, sustainable tourism, that's one of my favorites. I always thought sustainable tourism was making sure that managing tourism would not um, damage the environment unduly until I spoke with some hoteliers, very established and reputable people who understood sustainable tourism as ensuring that the tourists continue to come. And then I looked at the literature and there are different ways of understanding. And that's a question of norm penetration and norm contestation. You know, the international norm ensure that tourism structures do not damage the environment. And then local norms, not only in Trinidad, but in many places actually contest that international norm. Yeah, you can say that all you want, but just make sure the tourists keep coming. We'll manage what we can with the environment. And I'm not saying that either is right or wrong, but that's important because if we want to make laws and we want them to be implemented and we want people to be willing to implement them, we really need to think about what are the different norms that we're dealing with. And the book does that, does try to address that in the different areas that, we, that it addresses. Also, the issues of scale, size, power in global and regional environmental governance. Things look very different from the global perspective. You know, many people encourage small island states, for example, to adopt renewable energy, you know, and there's a global push for that. But then we have to look at things of scale and what do renewable mean in a small island where if the new piece of technology breaks down, we can't just go to the next city and buy another piece, you know, it will probably be months before we get a replacement. So understanding some of the dynamics needed to ensure good environmental governance at scales is also very, very important. And then the role of non-state actors, often they're the elephant in the room. And I tell my colleagues working in governments and international negotiations, don't forget what's happening outside of the international. Because what really makes things happen in the world are what the, private, the things that the private sector does in their own investments. You know? So it's not only about making the laws, but recognizing where the money is going and involving the non-state actors, be they the private sector, the certification agencies, etc. And then small states' perspectives. We have a lot to see. Um, when I go out there, I'm always so proud to hear 
about what representative of small states have done over the years at international forums. And we continue to have a lot to say. And the book tries to highlight as well what are the, in, the, what are the small states' perspective on, on many of these global issues. So who's the book for? Well, it's not a deeply specialist book. It's for diplomats because it deals with those global international issues, people working within international institutions, even development institutions. I was surprised at the level of depression that I caused when I presented on um, fossil fuel reform in, in Germany some year, no, in Sweden some years ago because there were representatives from the World Bank and from international agencies that were pushing Trinidad and Tobago to reduce fuel subsidies. And I had spoken in that research to all the prime ministers since independence, except for Eric Williams. Well, not all, sorry. I started at Manning and then I moved forward. And the reasons why politicians would or would not reduce fossil fuel subsidies had nothing to do with what these international organizations were thinking. They thought they were encouraging our states to change. And I told them, no, those things they're important, but what really matters in accordance with what these prime ministers said were a whole different series of things. I say that because it's very good when the development institutions understand what the locals are thinking instead of assuming that this is the best way to carry out political reform. And, and the book tries to address some of that. It's also, of course, for anyone with an interest in Caribbean affairs, anyone interested in understanding the dynamics. I'm particularly fascinated by the variety of actors from states to individuals that sometimes encourage people to think about things in a different way, to regional organizations, to NGO groups, etc. The dynamics and who influences who, where, under what conditions. The book tries to address that. And anyone with an interest in this can also um, be interested. And of course, hopefully my colleagues, academics, will read it when they want some nighttime reading, so they'll fall asleep well. The outline of my of the book. So these are the areas that the book deals with. Small island states in the and governance in the Anthropocene, thematic foundations, which I'll touch on in this presentation, sustainable tourism, climate change, global marine and ocean governance, renewable energy and energy security, cultural and natural heritage, the global trade environmental nexus, and finally new issues, key issues and emerging trends. Um, these are some of the areas that are of most relevance and importance to the region, and those were highlighted. So this is the framework of the text. Two more slides, and then I'm done. The, um, the, the framework of, the, te of the, the entire volume is on uh, what I call the thematic foundations. We know about the global effects of uh, of, of humanity's action, the effect of that on the environment, and the need for global response. And in many areas, we are responding, because I think there's something innate in humanity that even though we are actively doing things that might impact on the environment, we recognize that we have some uh, duty of stewardship. And uh, so I looked in, in this chapter at the conceptual pillars that will be recurring themes throughout. I also trace the evolution of the discipline. Global environmental governance is relatively new. It's less than 20 years, you know? Um, and, and that's seen in that very few people actually work on the governance side of the environment. We have some good text on, um, on maybe historical issues with regard to small island developing states. We have some good text on the science of environment in small island developing states. But the scholarship is now beginning or now sort of developing a, a bit more on governance, you know, like um, my somebody I, I admire very much, John Agard said, you know, I can he, he won the Nobel Prize for the, um, the last IPCC report intergovernmental panel on climate change. And he told me, you know what, I will continue to prepare the reports, the science, but those politicians, they just don't take it up. And, and he says, the problem is governance, you know, it's not that we don't know what we need to do, but we don't know how to get there. So linking those elements, that's what, uh, that's what we need to do, and that's the role of, of environmental governance. So this is my last slide. So this shows something that 
permeates all the elements of the book. First, I look, at, look from the inside out. I look at complexity. There are multiple elements of complexity. There are many actors. If you want to talk about tourism, uh, climate change, trade, biodiversity, anything, who are the actors? Not just the global ones, but think about the local ones as well. What are the forums at which these actors operate? Not only the international forums, but also the community groups, the families. Uh, what are the complex causalities? Who causes what, when, and under what conditions? And what are the conflicting agendas? Understanding that will enable us to begin to develop a framework for solutions. And then there are contested solutions. Often science is uncertain. It takes a lot before we get scientific certainty. And that can sometimes be a barrier towards decision making. Implementation is also a challenge. Because even when we know what to do, often in small island developing states, we lack the funding, we lack the resources. We certainly don't lack the interest and the capacity of those who are working in the fields. But often, uh, implementation can be a challenge. And not only implementation, but then enforcement, compliance, the second loop after the program has started, how do we ensure that it's sustainable, etc. That leads to look at the building blocks, because these complexity issues are always nestled within particular context, frameworks, power, which we can't discount and ignore, and there are many forms of power. So I was speaking to someone yesterday, and I was like, you know, another great catalyst of policy change is the environment. And they're like, what? You know, I thought it was the Ministry of Finance. And that's true. Ministry of Finance is an important catalyst of anything you want to do. But a, a, an important environmental event often changes the dialogue, changes the dynamic, and encourages it, it, such an event may encourage people to take the next step in what previously was considered to be too difficult. So power and who exercises power, what is power, etc., becomes very important. And then measuring quality. Oh, this policy was effective. Why was it effective? Because you implemented it? Because there were results? Because the results will have a long-term effect? Because the people involved felt that they were part of the process? There's so many elements of what is quality and what is success. And then the norms that I was mentioning before. And finally, that complexity and those building blocks are also nestled within a whole series of thematic issues. No? So first, global environmental governance. We can't ignore, we're not living, well, we are living on an island, but the island is now part of a global space. No? So we could never ignore what's happening globally. And we need to understand the undercurrents behind what is apparently happening at international organizations, etc. Then the relationships and the structures, um, who exercises agency, how that is measured, complexity as an international, as a global phenomenon as well. And then regional governance. We do a lot on regional governance. And Christopher Corbin, who is here, I always tell him, you know, he's the Caribbean Environmental um, Program guru. They, they've done a lot over, over 20 years, uh, and uh, our, our region is, is considered to be one of the, the best in terms of their capacity. The interests of states to actually come up with an international agreement and binding international agreement for the region on the environment. And therefore, our regional governance on many of these issues becomes very important. New actors that influence governments, um, that's also part of those thematic foundations, sustainable development, what sustainable development means for each group of actors also is different. The, we have the new sustainable development goals coming in, we had the millennium development goals, all of that understanding how that impacts upon, in fact, you know, some of my colleagues have done studies that show if we want to get one of the sustainable development goals, there's a bit of a trade-off, you know, clean energy for all, yeah, how do you do that without uh, introducing nuclear energy, for example, some would argue. Some would argue that nuclear energy goes against environment. Some people say that so even, even what we understand as sustainable development is complex. And then finally, the perspectives of small island developing states. And we very proudly championed the interests of, of SIDS in areas such as climate change, loss and damage for climate change, and many other issues. But as I said, I won't bore you with all the details right now. You read it on your own and fall asleep then, or hopefully not. So, so that's it for my presentation today. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. This was sustainable development. Key issues and questions. This is the last slide. I'm sorry. So here, 
here here is uh, is where because you are so so after all of this what does this book do you know so how does the global articulate with the local or the local with the global so regimes is a particular concept it's not just the organization it's the group of organizations individuals laws international agreements private sector groups that are involved in any particular area of governance which local development priorities norms regimes are are relevant for those global um, issues. And I look at, as I said before, areas of climate change, tourism, etc. The next question, environmental norms. Where are they and how do they behave? To what extent and how are these norms and trends embedded into or contested by local contexts? One of the things I found fascinating was the dual discourse on protection of cultural heritage in our region. Some people argue, let's keep it. Some people argue that it, it brings back painful memories, let's destroy it. And that's just at the local level. You compare that with the global discourses on the issue of cultural heritage or any other, and you see how complex it becomes. And then how do contexts matter? And that's particularly relevant in our part of the world because those, uh, our delegates go to these international organizations. The international organizations make decisions together with our delegates in our countries, but then how do we apply those in our particular economic, social, political, historical, cultural, geophysical and development context? And that's complex, that's complicated for us. And finally, what to expect? And the last chapter delves a bit into that, and I won't go too much into that, so you read the last chapter. And I do believe that that's the end of my presentation, yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Scobie. That was very thorough and very comprehensive and informative and insightful. Thank you for taking the time to go through those details with us and to enhance our understanding of this very important topic. Dr. Cola Lewis Cameron is Dean Designate of the Faculty of Social Sciences lecturer and head of the Department of Management Studies at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine. Her educational achievements include a Master of Science in Hospitality and Tourism Management and a PhD in Tourism Education from Brunel University in the UK. Dr. Cameron's teaching ex experience in tourism planning and policy and marketing and her research on consultants in the above areas have provided an all-round understanding of the industry. She's the lead editor of the text, Marketing Island Destination Concepts and Cases, and co-author of the text, Caribbean Tourism Concepts and Cases. Her research interests include tourism development in small island states, and more specifically, tourism education in the Caribbean, human resource development in the tourism industry in the region, and the impacts of tourism development on small island states. Welcome, Dr. Cameron, to provide reflections on the chapter, on chapter three, Sustainable Tourism, Governance, and Caribbean Seeds. I'm Sids. Welcome to the podium, Dr. Cameron. Pleasant good afternoon to the members of the Diplomatic Corps and other government officials director of the Institute of International Relations, Dr. Scobie, other specially invited guests. I wish to congratulate Dr. Scobie on her achievement on authoring this book, Global Environmental Governance and the Small States, Architectures and Agency in the Caribbean. This book, as we know, focuses on global environmental governance and Caribbean SIDS in the context of transformative environmental change in the Anthropocene and is particularly relevant given increased attention on the blue economy and matters of climate resiliency in the Caribbean. So tourism, which is my discipline, has a symbiotic relationship with the environment. It happens to be one of the most impactful activities on the environment, leading to lengthy discussions and debates on sustainable development of the sector, 
especially in this region, which is highly dependent on tourism for economic growth and development. In fact, the Caribbean is known as the most dependent region in the world on tourism development. And so this chapter on sustainable tourism governance and Caribbean SIDS addresses the questions, one, what does sustainable tourism look like from the perspective of Caribbean SIDS? And what are the international, regional, and national governance arrangements around this whole concept of, of sustainable tourism? And upon review, the chapter challenges policymakers and practitioners to go past the modernist perspective to tourism development with a focus on increasing tourist arrivals and attracting foreign investment to a greater focus on economic, environmental, and social sustainable tourism development. Again, this is a timely discourse in light of global observances of research on the topic of over-tourism and the detrimental, degrading, and debilitating effects on the environment that these larger, more developed tourism destinations have been experiencing, but have now surfaced due to discontentment and fiery protests by local residents. So for example, in popular destinations such as Venice, Barcelona, and Amsterdam, which receive thousands upon thousands of visitors on a daily basis, struggle to effectively manage the disposal of waste, which oftentimes end up in public waterways. Likewise, the chapter points to a similar situation in Caribbean SIDS, and I quote, the fact that the sheer volume of tourists in several islands substantially exceeds local populations has implications for managing the environmental impact of visitors and the environment. And so such elevated number of visitors challenge the carrying capacity of the natural environments to meet their water, energy use, and waste disposal requirements. So in response to the aforementioned questions, Dr. Scobie notes in her book, that sustainable tourism in the Caribbean appears to be mainly pursued as an act towards increased profitability by the private sector. This is reflected in many cases of what we may call greenwashing, where the term eco and environmentally conscious are used merely for marketing purposes and where products and services meagerly reflect the core principles of ecotourism or environmental sustainability. Dr. Scobie also notes that sustainable tourism is pursued tangentially by those that drive a core environmental agenda and aggressively by those that advocate for tourism, that advocate for sustainable tourism development and have incorporated it into its mandate. These actors, regardless of their varying motives and perspectives, exist in a complex network and are influenced by environmental norms such as inter and intra-generational equity, partnership, and equal right to access to justice, their mandates and geographical scopes. It is noted that these actors ranging from international organizations to regional bodies to national institutions and community groups are drivers behind the sustainability actions in small island developing states. The chapter notes, however, that tourism does in fact contribute to environmental degradation in SIDS. And I quote again from the chapter, Caribbean states share the fate of the other SIDS regarding the negative environmental impacts of tourism. The areas affected by tourism are always greater than the specific locations where the sector has its operations, as the surrounding ecosystems are also affected. Tourism has led to environmental degradation in the Caribbean in three main areas, pollution, poor land use, 
poor land use management, and resource misuse and overuse. The region suffered the progressive degradation of the environment as the tourism product evolved from the 1960s when these countries obtained independence and shifted from the traditional plantation economies to tourism. Tourism drove the building of condominium clusters on mountain faces, the building of resorts in wetland and mangrove areas, etc. Now this dependency will continue into the future with heavy reliance by the Caribbean tourism sector on the environment. Additionally, as it is recorded in the chapter, both the environment and tourism will also continue to depend on the context of economic development and the relationships between government regulators, the global and tourism operators, as well as local villages. Dr. Scobie offers us the solution that in part, as she proposes that environmental stewardship is sorely needed in our, in our Caribbean territories, to which I firmly agree. However, in the absence of political will, creation and enforcement of environmental legislation, and effective relations among key actors, then effecting the change that is desired to minimize negative environmental impacts on tourism may be near impossible. As I reflect, however, one of the best examples of environmental stewardship in relation to tourism can be found right at home in the example of Castara in Tobago. The UNDP, Castara Development, the UNDP, Castara Development, Castara Tourism Development Association, and the Division of Infrastructure, Quarries, and the Environment of the THA have teamed up to reduce solid and liquid waste caused by the residents and tourism activities. The CTDA is engaging in community awareness to assist community members to understand and minimize poor environmental habits. Soon, Castara, that little village in Tobago, will become the first village to eradicate the use of styrofoam boxes and to link its environmental sustainability efforts to its eco-brand promise, marketing and sales. So that's on the, the, the local front. On the regional front, the Caribbean Sustainable Tourism Policy Framework developed by the Caribbean Tourism Organization provides a strong foundation for sustainable tourism governance in the region. In fact, one of the key guiding principles of the policy is the presence of strong partnerships and integrated coordination of all efforts towards sustainable tourism. The policy on a whole offers distinct guidelines that relate to strengthening national institutional capacity and good governance in the planning, development, and management of sustainable tourism in the Caribbean. So we are seeing some strides in the right direction. Accounts like these echo the sentiments expressed in this chapter and verifies that governance structures are needed to implement sustainable tourism practices. As I conclude, Michelle, I want to thank you very much for taking the time out to put together this valuable piece of work. And uh, I just want to, to leave you with a, a quote from Holland Page in 1996, which says, for island states that have very few resources, virtually the only resources where there may be some comparative advantage in favor of island microstates are clean beaches, unpolluted seas, and warm weather and water, and at least vestiges of distinctive cultures. So as we go forward, the environment will continue to be important for the sustainability of tourism. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cameron. Um, especially for the um, hope that you've given to us um, 
in your presentation for the future of the environmental environmental issues in the Caribbean. I now introduce um, our next presenter speaker, Mr. Christopher Cobbin. He's a program officer within UNEP's Division of Environmental Policy Implementation and based at UNEP's Caribbean Regional Seas Program in Kingston, Jamaica. He is responsible for the sub-program for the assessment and management of environmental pollution and coordinates the development and implementation of national and regional projects and activities for two legally binding regional agreements. They are the protocols on oil spills and land-based sources of marine pollution, respectively. Mr. Cobbin has been employed with UNEP and based in Jamaica for the last 15 years following his recruitment in September 2004. He has worked on several regional projects, including um, regional GF, GEF um, funded projects for pesticide reduction on Central America and integrating watersheds and coastal area management in Caribbean seas. Mr. Corbin, a St. Lucia national born in Barbados, has over 30 years of experience in the development, implementation and evaluation of environment and sustainable development policies and projects. His substantive professional training is environmental monitoring and analysis with a first degree in natural sciences, double major in biology and chemistry, and postgraduate research in environmental toxicology. He has been involved in the development and implementation of national environmental strategies and plans and regularly present, represented the government of St. Lucia at technical and policy meetings relating to environmental management, coastal zone management, and resource conservation. And I will share a little bit of information with you that's not on Mr. Corbin's um, profile here. Mr. Corbin used to teach in St. Lucia. He was my teacher at <laughs> secondary school. So it is with great pleasure and honor that I welcome Mr. Corbin um, to um, give his presentation. Welcome, Mr. Corbin. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it seems that no matter where I am, I can't particularly hide from that experience of teaching in St. Lucia. But thank you and good afternoon to all. Uh, first of all, all protocol already established, but I certainly want to recognize the members of the diplomatic corps, members of, of government, uh, the professor, head and, and staff of the Institute of International Relations and other distinguished invited guests, fellow presenters, ladies and, and gentlemen. Uh, let me first of all join everyone who has sincerely congratulated Dr. Scobie, Michelle, on really an excellent piece of work and a work that everyone has said is, is so timely in the context of governance within Caribbean small island developing states. I think this is an effort that represents, I think my participation at, at this panel is indicative of a lot of the content of that book in, in, the, in the context of Michel looking outside of the traditional academic and research community to find out what is the role of non-state actors, what is the role of regional organizations, how can, we work, how can we work better together to improve the governance in the region. I want to thank her for allowing me to, to share a couple of, of slides with you. And, and what I've done in, in reflecting on, in particular, the chapter five, dealing with ocean's governance, is create a bit of imagery. Because I think what Michelle does in the chapter is really just highlight and showcase the real challenges that we as a region are facing as it relates to ocean and marine governance. So these are some images that are reflective of what we face as Caribbean small island developing states. From the impacts of sediment coming up from South America, working its way all the way through the Caribbean, to as we heard earlier, all actions have consequences and in small island developing states those consequences come quicker and often come in a much more severe way as a caribbean sea the aspect of regional collaboration is so key the caribbean sea is pretty much an enclosed environment so if we look at governance it's really no island is able to to, to protect its marine environment protect its coastal and marine resources without collaboration with its neighbors. And we heard mention about the significant role that small island developing states play 
in the negotiations on, on climate change and the 1.5 to stay alive. And, and I think the message that comes through, particularly in this chapter from Michelle, is that yes, as small island developing states, we are vulnerable, but we are not helpless. And we have a lot to contribute to the global discussion. But the complexity of the issues that I identified in that chapter, I think, bears some reflection. We are often referred to as small island developing states. There's an avenue of thought that would like to think of us as global marine states. But we are facing issues that show that nexus between what happens on land and what happens within our coastal and marine environment. Whether it be solid waste disposal on our pristine beaches, whether it's the impacts of sargassum, whether it's watershed management and degradation, or whether it's the significant impacts that happen during hurricanes and floods. So we, in, in how are we, from the governance perspective, how are we then as small islands able to balance that issue of natural resource protection, improvement in, in, in social equity, economic development, and environmental sustainability. And, and Michelle, in her opening, made a, a very, very cogent point in that there is a balance and there are trade-offs. So how can we make that balance between resource conservation, economic development, environmental sustainability, and social equity? It's all about improving quality of life. And I think she provides some, some excellent examples as how we as small island developing states, we have to have a governance framework and a structure that balances those four. So yes, how are we as Caribbean small island developing states looking to improve marine and ocean governance, it's our lifeblood, whether it be for tourism, for fisheries, uh, for maritime transportation, or as is what's happening now, this growing blue economy. What does that mean for us in the context of oceans governance? And then uh, there were several aspects that were mentioned in the chapter, but I, I just want to focus a little bit on some of the key words that Michelle identified, because this is what we as a, as a regional program of UN Environment see uh, so commonly throughout all of the small island developing states. Our ecosystems are precious but highly vulnerable. The economic development of this region is highly dependent on our Caribbean Sea, whether it be irrespective of what sector it is, the dependency is there. We have new opportunities, new opportunities relating to marine energy, marine bioprospecting. Uh, we've seen opportunities relating to blue economy. But what does blue economy mean in a governance context for our small island developing states? I think what Michelle referred to in the chapter, which we have certainly seen, and, and it really forces us again to reflect on how complex and interrelated the need for governance is when it relates to coastal and marine issues. Everyone has a stake, from private sector to civil society uh, to governments. Uh, how do you manage the demands of fishing versus farming? How do you manage tourism development versus conservation? How do you look at these geographical spaces? And as was mentioned earlier, how do you also deal with some very traditional cultural and and, and societal norms in terms of behavior. As an example, we have been trying to promote the whole issue of reuse of domestic wastewater or sewage. Culturally, in, our, in the Caribbean, that is an extremely difficult sell. It works in other parts of, of the world quite easily, but it really shows us if we're dealing with some of these challenging environmental issues, we really need to understand some of the, the drivers of our behavior and what's really needed to promote behavioral change. And then, like I think most of the governance in the Caribbean, we are very challenged with our limited human, technical, and financial resources. But I would say right there that we are very good in mobilizing a significant amount of project funding for the region but one may question, is this project funding being used to achieve the greatest impact possible? And, and some of the recommendations that Michelle gives in terms of how are we better able to integrate across sectors, I think will result in a significantly improved governance arrangement. Governance was identified coincidentally as the root cause 
for many of the challenges facing the management of coastal and marine resources, whether or not, whether it resulted in marine pollution, whether it resulted in, in damage to our sensitive coastal and marine ecosystems, whether it resulted in, in overfishing. And aligned with that weak governance, as has already been mentioned, the highlighting the human and financial resources, the lack of data and information, inadequate public awareness on participation, the cultural pressures, as well as the issues of, of trade and external dependency. So, so yes, I did take a little look at some of the other chapters in the book, and, and I think it really reflects that even as we have presented, as Michelle has presented these chapters as far as an important governance, there is still a cross-cutting link across all of the chapters. And I think as you look at the diagram on the right, which really represents only intergovernmental organizations in the wider Caribbean, we have quite frankly, a mass of potential conflict, overlap, and duplication. And I think this resource, because I'm already calling it a resource, should really help our intergovernmental bodies as they map out how are we going to improve governance. So we are a regional program, and, and, and as has been mentioned, I, I do reflect on some of the key areas that we, we deal with, pollution from land-based activities, from ships, from marine biodiversity. These are some of the issues that all impact on the coastal and marine environment in some way. And as Michelle has, highlight, has highlighted, one of the opportunities now is how do we see the coastal and marine environment contributing to the sustainable development goals? And I've just highlighted um, four of those goals here, which are the ones that form, you know, a lot of the effort, a lot of the projects and activities that we engaged in. So while goal 14 is primarily looking at oceans and coast issues for small island developing states, there's a very close interlink between coastal and marine resources and the other sustainable development goals. So as a region, the governance issue is just part of the framework where we need to address several coastal and marine issues in an integrated way. And, and Michelle in chapter five, does highlight what are some of those core areas of pressure that the marine environment faces from pollution to overfishing, to habitat degradation, to climate change. But underlying all of that, uh, how are we dealing with the policy, legislative enforcement and allocation of resources to allow this more increased integration and less fragmentation in that approach? So there are a few areas that have been recommended in the chapter, and I would certainly en endorse this. This is forming the basis for many of the projects and activities that we are now doing. We need to look at the overall policy, legal and regulatory frameworks, but as Michelle in, in the chapter has identified, we need to stop looking at these frameworks in the very traditional individual way. We look at tourism and their uh, policy framework. We look at agriculture, we look at environment, we look at fishing. And we're not looking at it in an integrated context from a governance framework. Then there are certain principles, which are, I would say, age-old principles of polluter pays and precautionary. And these are things that are well established in international law, but unfortunately, sometimes at national and regional levels, we forget. And the extent to which this becomes an integral part of the governance framework relating to coastal and marine resources and oceans needs to be key. I think fundamentally, although this chapter is about looking at our governance of our coastal and oceans, ultimately, we are all talking about improving quality of life for persons. And I think that link that is being done in the book throughout all of the chapters, that this is really about quality of life. It's about poverty reduction. It's about sustainable development. It's about minimizing risk to people from poor decision-making processes and poor governance. And we've recognized that there are weaknesses in capacity, weaknesses in knowledge. So the role, and, and, and this is where I'm, I'm, I'm really happy you know, to be part of this process, because we have been calling for a very long time of the need of having the academic and research community and the products coming from academia to more readily inform decision making, particularly within national governments. And I think a book such as this offers that opportunity by providing not just an academic and research body of knowledge, 
but some very pragmatic and practical recommendations as to how we should proceed if we really want to have improved governance. And this is where I, I think the multidisciplinary approach that Michelle has taken in her own work and in some of her pu publications, how do we now bring together our social scientists, our, our economists, our natural scientists to really understand some of the core reasons for the poor practices, the poor behaviors that are now evident? How do we get private sector more engaged? How do we get governments? And, and certainly to echo the, the comment that was made about Dr. Agard, the technical capacity often is there, but we're not seeing the impact. And in, in, it may mean that we need to rethink how are we communicating the message to our policy and decision makers. So I fully concur. I think, I think this, this book will certainly contribute to this whole broader outlook of, of governance. I would say particularly for Caribbean small islands with the increased emphasis on blue economy or blue growth or green economy, I think it is well placed. Um, I think it really gives us a, 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 a nice historical overview of where we are. I think we need to understand some of those histor historical and sociocultural dynamics, but recognize that small island developing states are unique. We cannot be simply lumped into a decision-making process at a broader international governance level. So we need to continue to demonstrate and showcase why we are unique, not that we are necessarily helpless, but we do need um, ways of doing things that are more customized. And then within the, the chapter, and I think it is so critical, and we have found this from our perspective as well, that we need to start thinking of broader partnerships. How can we engage uh, stakeholders and partners from a much wider range? Uh, how do we engage non-stake actors? How do we engage youth? It, it really is the only way that as small island developing states, we are, going to, we are going to see the necessary improvements in governance that we need. So, Michelle, I've actually already ordered our, the, the book for our office, so hopefully that will come soon. And I thought I would just end by an image which really typifies some of the, the, the dilemma that, that we have as it relates to sustainable development and unsustainable de development and recognizing the, the multiplicity of sectors that have to be looked at if we are really going to embark on a sustainable development agenda. And I think some of the recommendations that the book provides for improving governance is the only way that we can do so. So thank you so much again for being able to share some of these reflections. And I would just encourage everyone to get their copy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Corbin, for highlighting the policy relevance of this text and for endorsing as a practitioner the, 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 the recommendations, the practical recommendations that have been provided for the governance of this issue area. Um, thank you very much for that, sir. And um, I move now to introduce our next speaker, who is Dr. Susan Burke. She's a development specialist with over 15 years of professional experience, whose work involves teaching, research, and advocacy. She was formally trained in the areas of psychology, having a BA from York University in Canada, a master's in development studies from the Institute of, of Social Studies in the Netherlands, and a PhD in sociology from Essex University in the UK. Her work focuses on the areas of human resource management, organizational development and change, conflict management and workplace policies for HIV and AIDS, strategic planning, marketing and management of the cultural industries, events management and policy formulation and evaluation. She has worked extensively with a wide cross-section of public sector enterprises, civil society organizations and private agencies at the local, regional and international levels. She coordinates the Arts and Cultural Enterprise Management Postgraduate Program at the University of the West Indies and also lectures in Tourism Management, Cultural Studies and the Master of Marketing Programs at Cave Hill and St. Augustine. Since 2005, she has facilitated in the Event Management Certificate Program at the Arthur Logjack Graduate School of Studies. I welcome now Dr. Susan Burke to provide reflections on Caribbean cultural and natural heritage governance um, chapter seven of this publication. Welcome to the podium, Dr. Booth. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, everyone. It is indeed my pleasure to be here. Uh, all protocols observed, but I just want to say, um, members of the Diplomatic Corps, the Director of the Institute of International Relations, of course, the star of this afternoon's proceedings, Dr. Michelle Scobie, and of course, members of the academic fraternity, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I was asked to look at chapter seven, which deals with uh, the Caribbean cultural and natural heritage governance. And I want to start off by saying that Dr. Scobie gives a, an, an extremely comprehensive um, reading of the context in the Caribbean, but also gives us a sort of way forward, and for that, I think we can start looking at the ways in which um, we, co we collaborate and begin to do more um, with what we have done already. So the chapter gives us an international and regional framework for the operations of the natural heritage in the Caribbean. It cites the several UNESCO, UN, um, World International Property Organization, all of the uh, the, the um, laws and regulations that guide us. It also um, goes on to talk in detail about some of the problems in terms of implementing. And I know the two speakers before talked about the importance of governance. But I think Dr. Scobie takes us a little more beyond governance. And she begins to talk about issues that we know, those of us who operate on the ground, the importance of the lack of political will, the fact that we lack some of the technical skills in terms of um, developing reports, in terms of community-based organizations being involved in the notion of heritage. So she drills deep in terms of letting us know what some of those uh, challenges and implementation issues are. And I will talk about that in a little more detail later on. But of course, she also identifies some smart practices. And I think it, within the smart practices, we can begin to develop a framework, even as she laid it out in her presentation, the complexity of operating and re regulating frameworks in the Caribbean based on our colonial heritage and what are the things we could do. And she ends the chapter on forecasting, looking at some of the things that are possible, laying out, even as she does so, some of the challenges that we have, given what she calls the anti-conservation movement. Yes? So the issue, for instance, of who conserves what, what is heritage, all of those naughty issues that we need to understand. So inside of the chapter, she also frames a lot of what um, is said within a UNESCO action plan. And that is where I think the chapter takes off in terms of looking at the action plan that gives us a way forward in terms of building on existing resource mobilization efforts in other sectors. And in cultural policy, which is where I come from, which is where I live, we call that joined up thinking so that you're looking at the intersection of various policies, environmental policy with economic policy, with trade policy, with education policy, et cetera, and looking at how you can jump on the bandwagon. You know in Trinidad and Tobago, we have a very, the Creole is so beautiful because it talks about bandwagoners, you know? And so when you get on the bandwagon, it means that you are building on, a, on momentum that is already there. And I think as a livable strategy, um, Michelle is to be commended for pointing that out um, and building on that in the chapter. Then, of course, identifying country-specific funding opportunities. That's a no-brainer, of course. Um, and we tend to um, know when funding is available. Um, and the thing that 
um, we, we want to kind of pay, pay more attention to in terms of funding is the fact that even though funding is available, having just come out of the Caribbean Development Bank issuing um, a call for um, funds in the creative and cultural industries in the region, they got over 300 applications. So it's one thing to have funding, but it's the competitiveness of the funding and what we um, want to do with the funding. So yes, mobilizing existing UNESCO field offices and expertise, that too is critical. I just got off the phone this morning with the Director of Culture for Jamaica. And as you know, Jamaica seems to be on a roll in terms of accessing um, the expertise there's a UNESCO field office in Kingston, and I think that they work, to, they work that to their advantage. Yeah? So they were able to get the reggae recognized as intangible heritage, and she tells me that we have another one coming, you know, one is, 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 is being considered now. So the um, proximity of expertise in your area, if you know how to tap into it, can actually be used um, in your favor. And then, of course, the thing that all people like myself remember, I don't even know that we do this anymore, right? But it's encouraging South-South cooperation, looking South, looking within, as opposed to looking North or looking West. Um, and I think, you know, based on the several crises that we see happening in North America and Western Europe, the notion of looking South becomes particularly important for us as a people. Uh, not just because it is an inevitability, but because it makes sense. And because we can no longer, in a real sense, look to the West or look to the North for any kind of guidance that would um, help us in that sense. We need to be the architects and the authors of our own fate. So I wanted to talk a little bit about why what Michelle has done in her book is so important because we're talking about natural heritage, but what we're really talking about is memory. And in the cultural studies discipline that I come from, we understand that heritage and memory are critical to people's identity. But we know that like any other social phenomenon, memory is socially and culturally constructed. So then it becomes a political issue. Memory narratives can be powerful agents of knowledge and of course, they have the ability to engender change in both public and private domains. And in that sense, memory and heritage are critical because they determine how we see ourselves and who we are. Heritage is linked to memory, which represents what we call the intersection of collective experiences. And in the Caribbean, because of that intersection, because everybody who is here, according to Lloyd Best, came from somewhere else and has different agendas, that issue of memory and knowledge and therefore heritage becomes particularly political and contested. A critical component of memory is that for it to have value, it must be communicated and represented. This becomes a very, very complex domain in the Caribbean. And I think uh, Michelle pointed to that complexity um, in her presentation when she started to talk about power and who has power and so on, right? So for us, I want to, to leave this for a little while and I'll come back to that. So the politics of heritage, therefore, becomes an important issue in the way in which we frame uh, the, the chapter. And the questions I asked myself as I was reading the chapter was, who decides what is heritage? And what should be protected, preserved, and promoted? And how is that represented? So on the screen, there are two pictures. There's one on top, the, at the top, which is a, a chattel house in Barbados, which of course um, is protected by the National Trust of Barbados. And at the bottom, does anybody know what picture that is? What that represents? I couldn't get a really good picture, I'm afraid. Not Grey Friars. Everybody thought I would do Grey Friars. Ha ha ha. No, this is Beryl McBurney's house. Yes that we demolished, right? The Grand Dam of Caribbean Dance. Her house was demolished in 2016. And we all stood there and we did the thing that we normally do and, you know, it is no more. 
So as we sit here this evening, I want us to come to terms with the politics of heritage, yes? And who decides who gets what and what and how money is allocated. And I think that's one of the things I want to tease out a little bit, drawing from what um, Dr. Scobie talked about in her chapter. In the Caribbean, policy tends to be state-driven a lot. And the reasons for the state driving policy are obvious. We're small, we don't have the knowledge, the technical capability, and so on. But this becomes a real issue in the real world. So that in the book, in the chapter, Michelle talked about the lack of political will, the lack of public sensitization, competition from scarce funding, development um, over heritage, the lack of technical knowledge, and all of these things. But then the state decides what they will want to protect, and the people who have the know-how and the people who have a seat at the table are the ones who determine what gets protected. In many of our countries, these national trusts have vested interests in protecting a particular segment of our culture. Yes? And so I have up there Exhibit A, which I was involved in in 2002. That's to tell you how long we've been doing this. June 2002, we were called by the ministry, some colleagues and I, to develop a proposal to have the carnival seen as an oral and intangible heritage. We were called three weeks before the deadline for proposal. No, I mean, we need to get real in the room. This is, this is really actually what happens. So we were called late. Um, we worked all night and day. But of course, with three weeks, you can't do a lot. There was no follow-up with us. There was a lack of technical knowledge and the unwillingness to spend money to buy the expertise that we needed to help us develop the proposal, which is what we have in front of us there. So the proposal was submitted, and it needed to be revised and resubmitted. And the government decided, we don't care. So how many years later, we're crawling that Jamaica has actually done something with their reggae. But we had an opportunity in 2002 to do something with Carnival, and we just didn't follow up on it. Yeah? And that is the real world scenario of what happens in terms of what we do with our heritage. Right? So I want to um, take off from where uh, Michelle left in terms of where do we go from here. And as I said earlier, one of the things, and I think the previous speaker um, talked about this as well, is the bundling of policies, right? The way in which we see from the local to the national, to the regional and global, how policies can intersect in a particular space. So we need to look at these things. Um, we were involved in the crafting of the new cultural dr policy, draft cultural policy. And one of the things that we kept saying to them was, we need to understand the role of education, the role of trade, the role of community development. And so in the development of a cultural policy, which has a sub-policy on heritage, by the way. And I see Dr. Niles is just entering the room. He was one of the people working on the policy as well. And a couple of weeks ago, I was quite surprised to find out that when we were actually developing the draft cultural policy, the policy unit of the ministry was also working on a community development policy. And I said to the person, but why weren't we working together? It seems to me to be such an obvious fit. But again, this notion of working in silos is the thing that very often works against us. The other thing I want to move Two, obviously, is the involvement of community, so building from the bottom up. And um, I have an example of the American Museum. Anybody here knows who the American community is in Trinidad and Tobago? I happen to be American, so this is of particular importance to me. And in the consultations on cultural policy, one of the things that one of the representatives from the American community talked about, and I have the quote here at length, Right, is that they have developed a model that actually bundles all of the policies. So it's education, it's community, it's health, and so on. And they use local and regional funding to help them develop their museum. Yes? So it gives them a voice, and it is actually a smart practice. And the other thing I want to talk about, which is part of 
what I think Dr. Scobie did in her chapter is the formation of what I, it's a very ugly term, but I call it grocalisms, right? So it's global, regional, local, and the, the bundling of those two so that there is a seamless thread that runs through global in terms of the international protocols, regional in terms of, of, of the CARICOM and uh, protocols, and then at the local level. And I think the American Museum is a testament to how well that can work and how well that can scale. So we need to be thinking in, in, you know, immediately about the threading of those different levels. And some, in some instances, they actually leave out the national. Right? So the national is less important. So it's local communities working with a regional body, like CDB or whatever, that is working with an international body. And that, I think, can help us. And then, of course, the harmonization, embracing all that is of our heritage and finding the spaces where we learn to not operate in silos. We learn to um, contest. And, of course, policy making is very messy. It can be very ugly. But what you do if you don't try to harmonize is that you run the risk of silencing and marginalizing huge spots of your community, right? So I want to end with a quote from Stuart Hall that says, those who do not see themselves reflected in national heritage are excluded from it. And so I think it is really important that Dr. Scobie wrote um, this book, that she took some time to think about heritage um, cultural heritage. I think it fills a lacuna in the discussion around the frameworks and governance. I think we need to start talking about how we move the agenda forward in, in, in little ways. Sometimes I think in the Caribbean we feel development has to happen in a big way, but it's little steps by little steps and it's incremental. Yeah, And so if we begin to understand the naughtiness and, and we appreciate the complexities of the problem, I think that we are going to be on the right track. So once again, I want to congratulate Dr. Scobie on her book and for inviting everybody here. And it is a welcome addition to the literature on cultural heritage. Congratulations. By the book. Thank you very much, Dr. Burke. This was particularly interesting um, for me, and I am sure for the audience for highlighting the political um, dynamics and power dynamics and relations involved in, in those particular issues. You know, sometimes when we think about um, subject areas, we think of these areas, we think about the technical aspects, but, you know, it was very important to hear um, the, you know, the, the issues of politics surrounding those areas. And I really appreciate um, your presentation for that reason. And we are moving along to the final presentation. Um, um, Dr. Anthony Gonzalez will hear his presentation. And because we have to end at five, there might not be too much time for questions. Um, but we hope that, you know, at least we can get burning questions, a few burning questions from the audience. Dr. Anthony Gonzalez is a graduate of the University of the West Indies, where he completed a bachelor's degree in economics and sociology, as well as a postgraduate diploma in international relations. He pursued his doctoral degree at the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva in international economics. He worked as a lecturer, senior lecturer, and acting director, and is now an honorary senior fellow at the Institute of International Relations. He worked as an industrial cooperation expert at the ACP Secretariat in Brussels and actively participated in negotiations of the second Lomé Convention and worked part-time as an investment promotions officer for the ACP EC Center for Development of Industry. He has served in several other capacities, including WTO Director and Representative of the Caribbean Regional Negotiating Machinery in Geneva, Vice Chair of the Smaller Economies Consultative Group in the Free Trade, of the Ameri um, Free Trade Area of the Americas, Chairman of the ACP High Level Trade Advisory Group, President of the Trans Tobago Economic Society, and Consultant to various national, region, and international organizations. Dr. Gonzalez, welcome. We look forward to your presentation.
Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Pleasant good evening to all uh, members of the Diplomatic Corps, members of international organization, fellow colleagues, uh, the director of the Institute, ladies and gentlemen. I was asked to make a few comments on the chapter dealing with trade and the environment. And I, when I looked at the chapter, I began to wonder who would dare to try to synthesize all that material that is involved in trade and the environment. It's a tremendous challenge. And um, when I looked at it, I, 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 my commendation for Michelle's work group, and this is why I would like to particularly congratulate her on, on this launch and doing a work that is indeed very relevant to, to this region. I say this because for one who has participated in this discussion about trade and the environment, um, I understand how complex it is. Sometimes just one of those topics or subtopics, sub themes, can be, can be a whole book. If we take fisheries um, subsidies, for instance, that is a discussion that, as you pointed out in the, in the book, is a discussion that has been going for 18 years in the WTO and it is not yet finished. You express hope that it would be finished this year. Let's, let's see what happens. But it is a terribly complex issue. And if you come to it from the point of view of governance, you begin to see when you bring into play all these actors that she speaks about, you begin to understand how difficult it is. And at times, your enemies as small states are not necessarily the traditional ones. You may find that when you come to this, to solve these problems, that your the enemies are actually sometimes within. That there are even small states who don't want you to get certain kinds of things in terms of what you're what you seeking. So it's a very complex matter. And I think you do understand that. And you do point out that to some extent in the text and you refer the author to other readings to try to complement what you have. So I would say that the aim of your text is to try to find this nexus between trade, uh, in terms of governance, the nexus between trade and the environment. And uh, you start on the basic premise that globalization has increased the scale and impact of production and consumption cycles on the environment, and because of the complexity of the processes involved, global governance solutions are required. I think that's a basic argument that we can all accept, that we need global governance solutions because of this complex phenomenon uh, that, has, that has emerged. The intention is, of the work is not to cover all aspects of trade on the environment. Obviously, that would be an impossibility, and therefore the author decides to select a few key areas that she believes uh, are relevant to this particular region. And, 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 and those areas that she has selected ha have basically to do with the green economy, um, trade in biological products, the WTO regulatory regime, international environmental agreements, and integration and trade. I think of it's natural that these five or six areas would be the ones that are most important to us in this region, and that's why she elect, elected. But that's, that selection is based on the, the problem I raised at the start, which has to do with just dealing with the technical complexity of all and all the issues that are intermingled with this. One has to do that kind of selection. The other areas, of course, that one could talk about energy security, trade rules, and so forth, which she has pointed out that these need to be addressed as well. But of course, that would be, I guess, for a later piece of work. I think the approach she takes is to try to examine the overlapping network of sector of actors, sorry, specific to each of these areas, which include states, of course, transnational corporations environmental NGOs and private sector regulators, individuals and certifiers. 
both of these areas, trade and the environment, they have separate international legal and regulatory regimes. The environment is shaped by hundreds of international and bilater bilateral, as well as regional agreements, as well as agencies and networks similar to those in international trade. Now, this just gives you an idea of the range that you're dealing with. All these various actors, all these various agencies, both in trade as well as in, in the environment. So after noting the pros and cons of the impact of trade on sustainable development, a subject which is, is in its own right is very important and which we could discuss at length here, the author looks at the major international environmental agreements that govern trade. She concludes that the extent to which these environmental agreements can have positive sustainability outcomes depend critically on the effectiveness of national regulatory frameworks the environmental sensitivity of consumer demand, the power of non-state actors, that is the ability to press for sustainable consumption and production, and the willingness of, of the private sector to comply with precautionary and sustainability principles that are the foundation of these agreements. So in order for these international agreements to be effective, unless you have these four basic tenets at work, you're not going to get the kind of results that, you, that you're looking for. The author then looks at the WTO to try to see how in promoting freer trade um, uh, by ensuring that the national trade policies of states do not have a negative environmental impact on other states. She tries to examine how that works, as well as the reverse, how environmental policies do not impact negatively on trade. The focus here is largely on subsidies, that is how subsidies are used either to protect uh, uh, the lo local production or to promote exports, particularly in the area of fossil fuels and, and fisheries, where subsidies have um, been very damaging to the environment. The conclusions, um, can be nuanced uh, when one introduces se sorry, several other factors. Um, she, of course, could not go into all that, all that in, that, in that particular area. Um, she highlights essentially how these subsidies impact on, let's say, small developing countries by overfishing and overexploitation of the seas and so forth. Um, but the, 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 the nuances that I'm referring to come to have to deal basically with um, how do you tell, for instance, a, an artisanal fisherman somewhere in Vanuatu in the Pacific that he cannot get a subsidy from the state when his livelihood depends on it. See, it comes down basically to some of these critical things when you begin to, to delve into it. I mean, some of these countries themselves depend on subsidies coming from the developed countries. The developed countries send out large fishing vessels to these, uh, in these countries, and they use these subsidies to pay these governments in order to have access to, to the fishing. So in that sense, the discussion is a very nuanced one. I just wanted to point that out, not expecting that she would have the time to delve into all these areas. And remember, as I said, she's coming to this from a governance perspective. She's trying to highlight, essentially, what are the main actors at play here in terms of determining um, the, the impact on the unsustainable development. She then focuses on trade agreements of Caribbean states, in particular the WTO agreement and the Caribbean, um, the, the CARI Forum EU EPA agreement. She believes that it is too early to assess the consequences of trade and the environment in the economic partnership agreement, as implementation has been a problem for the CARI Forum countries because they lack the capacity to do so. I have a little difficulty here. I think that certainly there is a capacity problem, but to some extent there's also a political problem in terms of getting the implementation done. But certainly I accept the point that a um, lot of them do not have the legal technical capacity to really implement effectively the agreement. And to some extent, you find that a number of things have not, have not been done. 
The role of the private sector in governance is then examined. And um, the aim is to try and demonstrate how useful these actors are in setting sustainability standards, enforcing them and complementing the work of the state. The work of the UN Global Compact, as well as the ISO, are underscored in this, in this regard. And the author tends to think that there's a danger of private certif certification being dominated by large firms at the expense of smaller firms um, in this regard. I think that's the main, main consideration, the main point I draw from that uh, um, examination of the private actors. That is the large firms are tending to dominate in that exercise and the smaller firms, especially small, small, when we say small firms in this region, we really mean small. We're talking about firms that are by and large below 200 employees and there's a danger there. As regards the trade in biological products, governance is considered key for sustainable development. As the region is rich in biodiversity, there are important international agreements that are examined here. For instance, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, as well as the Convention on Biodiversity and the region's own legal frameworks as the Cartagena Convention. The green economy is finally tackled, and the goal here seems to be to, to secure an environmentally friendly economy that conserves resources, minimizes negative impacts on, as pollution and, and, and emissions, and produces goods and services which are environmentally beneficial. The author notes that trade in biologi biological products and services is not only meant to protect biodiversity, but human health, food, food safety, and ensure the livelihood of local communities. The latter takes the author into several other areas of this subject, including geographical indications in, in intellectual property regimes. And that again shows you the breadth and the range in which she's covering. She goes off into in, in geographical indications. I didn't expect to, to find that there, but that's again another very, very complex area. But she's trying to tie up all these ends in terms of that discussion of of governance because in fact they are quite relevant to trying to understand what is happening outside here in trade. She looks at green, green technologies and I think the warning that she is signaling here is that we are not uh, coming to terms with the green technologies that are being developed and that we are becoming very dependent on green, green technologies from outside and we, you know, that would create some problems for us. So in conclusion I would say that uh, the author notes that uh, SIDS and developing countries on the whole may not benefit from the diffusion of soft power away from large states to, to, to private and NGO, and, and NGO sectors. That is to say, of course, there's a shift away from states to transnational actors, to uh, NGOs and to, and to um, the private sector, but that shift of soft power should be lived would not necessarily benefit us because these agencies tend to uh, reinforce the dominant trade narratives and power asymmetries, just like the states uh, from which they, they come. I think that's a, an interesting observation and one that needs some examination. I also believe that to some extent, I don't know if she tackled it in other parts of the book, I also believe that the new configuration of power in the world which has taken away from the West a fair amount of power it had in these agencies. For instance, in the WTO today, the WTO is no longer dominated by the West. The cold collapse of the Doha Agreement has to do with the fact that China and India have become big powers in the WTO, and they're calling the shots. So that, um, to some extent, that new configura configuration of power may or may not have worked in the favor of the six countries, the small countries. So that is something that we may need to look at. Uh, there's a concern for eco-labeling and the extent to which important restrictions on biological resources and GMOs would occur. Um, uh, SIDS should be very wary of the growing involvement of non-state actors in eco-labeling because more and more of this private eco-labeling is playing a role in, in terms of restricting trade and restricting uh, the impact of global supply chains on, on, on trade. Well, to conclude, basically, I would say that 
the chapter is quite ambitious, as I mentioned from the start. Um, even though it takes a selection of the areas to examine, it still covers a quantum of themes and sub-themes in the, in the field of trade and the environment. Understanding the focus of the author, which is the evolving global governance, is key to not getting lost in these subjects, which are very technical, and each one in their own right can be discussed in a separate book. That is to say, uh, for my own sanity in, in reading this in this piece, I, I had to keep up in mind basically that her focus is on these, this question of governance, both from a private sector point of view, as well as from a public sector point of view. And that all the various subjects that she was examining there, that she, this is what she was basically concerned about. The contribution therefore in this chapter, which brings together in 20 words, some of the most fundamental themes and the broad range of subjects in trade and the environment, um, essentially does make a contribution to the literature. It, it, it serves as a kind of introduction to the breadth of the subject, just giving the reader some essential insights, but forcing him or her to go into the more specialized subjects in other chapters or, or elsewhere. In this way, it provides a very useful, up-to-date foundation of knowledge in this, in this area. And it's in this sense, as I said in the beginning, I want to commend her, in that it's a good way to start if you want to get that overview of that field and understand it from a governance point of view. It's a very good way to start. She's just teasing you and she's just introducing you and she's telling you, look, this matter is very, very difficult and complex. You have to read a lot more. But if you start here, it's a good way to, to, to get ahead in the future. Thank you very much, Adam Shem. Thank you very much, Dr. Gonzalez. I, I must agree, Dr. Gonzalez, that the area of trade is an area that's usually very daunting and very technical. And thank you, Michelle, for providing us with an overview and a foundation where you know we can take off into the other specific and specialized areas. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Gonzalez, for bringing you know that to our attention. You know that it can be um, dealt with um, as as the overview has been provided. Now we only have um, about seven minutes left and, and we still have to do a vote of thanks. So at this point in time, I will invite questions from the audience. We'll take about three questions. We may be able to take two rounds of questions, three questions at a time. Um, and you just quickly, briefly, um, we have mics at the back. Um, once you raise your hand and you indicate you're interested in posing a question or making a comment, um, we'll take the mic to you and then um, we'll take three questions at a time. So we have somebody to the back. Hi, good afternoon. Gina Granado, the Australian High Commission. Um, would like to say congratulations firstly to Dr. Michelle Scobie on providing a sort of roadmap in what we would think is a very contested and very confusing area such as environmental governance. Um, my question is, um, you use the word framework or governance um, throughout this text, uh, which suggests this need for structure. And in a region as highly contested geopolitically as the Caribbean, how do you exactly see or what do you prescribe as a framework or how the structure should actually unfold? Um, I don't know if that would be a very clear or easy answer, um, question to ask. But um, are you prescribing a particular model of sort? And if so, what, what would that look like? Thank you. All right, we'll take two other questions in this round. Okay, Dr. Scobie. Mm, thank you, um, Ms. Granado, for that um, question. And uh, um, I can give you the short answer, which is read the book. But, uh, um, but more seriously, um, you're right. It's, uh, it's a complex matter. What is governance? Governance can be understood as the steering by a multiplicity of actors towards a particular goal in a particular context. 
and environmental governance that's staring in the context of the environment, which the book tries to show involves many things. And I think because of that, I could not prescribe a particular model of governance. In fact, each of the chapters has different dynamics and different ways of approaching governance. No? However, what the book tries to do in each chapter is to insist that any model of governance needs to include an understanding of context. And that's, that's I think, the, 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 the main message of the book, that no governance can happen without understanding context, the variety of actors involved, their roles, the possibilities for the impl and implications for the future, and context include not only the context on the ground, but also international, regional context. Uh, governance can't happen without the science community. You know, often we, we decide, okay, let's do this, we have the money, who are we going to get to do it? But without science, you might have to start over again because they're interesting points. So I think what the book does when it speaks about framework is a framework that recognizes complexity and a, a framework that encourages uh, cohesive involvement of multiple actors at all the stages of intervention. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Scobie. Do we have um, more questions? Um, Jerry, it's modest. Good afternoon. First of all, let me congratulate you for your excellent book. It's just the first publication, I think, because you have to move forward. I think this publication is a big effort of identifying the building blocks of environmental governance, but we have to go ahead we have to examine how these blocks interact internally within others and in particular contexts. If I think if we find how this moves, we will, we will find the whole system and we'll be able to like making a very nice uh, framework about environmental governance. Thank you. Do we have another question? I don't know your Sorry. opinion about that. Thank you very much for your question. Do we have other comments or questions from the audience? Anyone? Okay. If we have no additional questions, we will ask Dr. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> Thank you, Ambassador. I, I recognize that, that that concern comes from your deep knowledge of the multiple uh, realities on the ground. Uh, a second step, I will contemplate it in a second book, <laughs> but you're pushing me in that direction. I do appreciate that, that some of those, you know, the intersection of those things uh, are quite complex. Some years ago, I, I wrote on um, policy coherence in climate change governance and that it, it took a year to even put together what that would look like and uh, of course doing that for each of these fields is something which I appreciate is important thank you for that I might invite you to be co-author when I actually get that done <laughs> and um, finally um, last final comments or remarks from the presenters um, if you want to say anything, um, you're welcome to make an intervention at this stage before we get before we take the vote of thanks. No final comments or okay. Yeah. Anyway, you said it. Um, okay, thank you very much, um, Dr. Scobie. Welcome um, to the podium to present the vote of thanks. Okay, so thank you. I, I didn't expect people to be here still towards the end of the, the afternoon. So thank you for, for being able to stay and continue. Uh, the dedication of the book is, and I quote, to the creator who created the universe that is stewards we strive to protect. 
and uh, I am just sort of one of his instruments trying to work from my little corner in the globe to, to work on environmental issues and obviously none of this would have been possible without him neither would it be possible without my family and friends my mom is here sitting down in the front wave mom <laughs> And uh, uh, and so many friends. I mean, I think the room is filled with with most of you are really good friends of mine and colleagues and friends. And I do appreciate it could not have been done without you. Often conversations in the passageways may have sparked an idea that then later developed into part of the book. Obviously, thank you very much, Professor Byron, for your great support, Anita. Um, Peter, Suzanne, Akola, and uh, and the rest of my colleagues sitting in the audience here for your support uh, and uh, creating the kind of community that would do something like this. Of course, this is just one book. There are many books that the that the university has published and the institute has recently published. So I'm just one in a list. You know, you can read theirs before mine. No, no hard feelings. And th theirs are also very good, better. So so that's that's. Uh, that's important. I'd like to thank the Secretariat of the Institute for International Relations as well as the library for their support in putting this together. It could not have been done, of course, without the technical support from uh, Jerry, Jared Modest and John Maloney, who provided, as you can see, fantastic and perfect um, technical support to make this event possible. And finally, I'd like to thank, of course, I'd like to thank very much my um, colleagues who took the time. It's a very busy time of year for us. You know, it's the end of semester, exams. Uh, any colleague who is here is, is heroic, really, because you have a lot of other things to do, especially those who actually uh, took the time to read the chapter and uh, to, to provide what was really insightful. I really wanted them to speak from their expertise and that's what they did. So I think we got a double treat here. I certainly did listening to them um, present each on their field. So really a hearty thank you. And um, all the way from Kingston, traveling to and from, arriving in Kingston and still managing to do this and buying the book, yeah. Thank you very much, Christopher, for that. And finally, not, last but not least, to the members of the Diplomatic Corps, Embajador, muchas gracias, um, for the, uh, all the university students, all the members from the different uh, organizations, many of whom I've worked with in different fields, um, colleagues from the university, uh, persons from the ministries as well. Um, and of course, students, none of this would be possible without you. What Ms. Granado didn't say, that she was one of my star students when I, one, of, when I, one, of the, one of the first times I offered the course, and it seems that she's still speaking with me. That's, that's very good, you know. So thank you for that, Gina. And, and finally, once again, thank you everyone for coming, for participating. Um, at the back, there are some flyers because there's a promotion on the book, a very big promotion on the book. So there's a promotional code. So if you intend to buy it online, um, you can use the code there and you get it to make a 35% discount. So that's, that's quite good. So once again, thanks to everyone for coming and have a good afternoon.